Welcome everyone to what is the very first session of our Economics Network online symposium for this year. Um, it's the very first session of five, so I just wanted to maybe give you a little bit of a run through of um, how we envisage these uh, sessions to unfold over the over the series. We don't yet have dates for the rest, um, but it's very much a work in progress. And really part of today is to get more of your ideas also through the Padlet that Ashley has, I think, already put in the chat on what how we want to use the time together to make this um, useful. So for today, um, we've got Alvin Haberti, of course, uh, from Bristol and Ian, telling us about the big issues around assessment in a digital world. So really today is about setting the scene. And of course, Carlos Cortinas will be telling us about um, his survey findings and reflections around this issue as well. But there'll be lots of time for us to have Q&A and discussion and work together to sort of map out what else would be useful. But just to give you a preliminary um, flavor of what uh, we've been thinking about in the group on um, in the symposium and conference group about what this sessions could look like. Um, I think one of the questions that emerges is that generative AI is sort of out of the box. It's out there, it's being used, but there's a lot of discussion about um, its ethical use. What would that look like? Um, how do we communicate that to students? What are the principles underpinning ethical use of generative AI? And if we wanted to you know, what are they and how do we communicate them? What are the implications for departments or for the design of assessment? Um, there are, I guess there are related issues around data protection. If we have students putting in content in AI, there are issues there. Um, and of course, people are using it in research. Maybe there's an ethical dimension, either in research that we do as um, economists or even the research that our students are doing. So maybe that's a place to begin. And then there is, um, the colleagues who are very keen to try and make their assessments resilient to AI. Um, and we're quite keen to invite colleagues who have found interesting ways to make their uh, assessments more resilient, to give us some elevated pictures of how they've gone about doing that. Um, one way is to try and make our assessment more authentic, although now in the real world, people are using AI. So maybe it is authentic to be using AI. Um, how do we design out AI? Uh, what are the academic integrity implications? But some of you have already mentioned uh, fairness and equity. Um, the fourth session we envisaged was around um, embracing AI. How do we harness it in our assessment? Maybe some wider issues on digital assessment uh, beyond AI. If we're going to be assessing students using AI, we might want to think a little bit about how do we scaffold that into our courses? And I guess that's the next step, um, making it part of what we deliver. And then after we've seen that, we thought it might be useful to actually get an employer panel together. How are um, the employers of our students using AI? And can we learn from that in some way when designing um, assessments? So that's kind of the, the roadmap of where we are. Um, but it's there's a lot there and we only have an hour every time. So um, I think you know there's lots of room for planning. So that's it uh, from me on that. Um, we'll, I really look forward to sharing, you know, hearing your ideas. Uh, and um, I pass over to Alvin to sort of tell us his insights. So um, I'm only going to, I'm hopefully just going to take uh, 10, maximum 15 minutes of your time and then pass over to Carlos, who's got a few survey uh, results that he wanted to, that we wanted to share, share with you. So I just want to kind of, you know, this is called setting the scene. And I just want to talk broadly about, you know, the impact that this um, this this technology has had uh, on our sector and on economics in particular, and some of the issues that this series will have to raise. Dimitris already talked about some of those. So I just want to put this into a, a bit more of the round. And so, you know, I... I was surprised actually when I looked back at this um, this Chat GPT page that it it was released on November the thirtieth, twenty twenty two. So in a year and a bit, um, so much has happened, uh, and the world appears to be very different to what it was in those months leading up to November the thirtieth, twenty twenty two. And I remember some people in our engineering department getting in touch around September October time, 
telling us this thing was around the corner and um, and it's going to be profound. And we didn't quite believe them at the time, but it really did make a significant impact. And just um, the, the context here is, you know, ChatGPT goes back a few years before that and these generative AI engines, there was version one, two, and then 3.5 was the one that was released to the public um, here. So, um, okay, let me move on. Um, so I want to just, a year later, in 23, in December 23, this paper came out in the Journal of uh, Economic Literature, and actually it's a very thoughtful, um, quite a long thoughtful piece about the impacts of uh, AI on economics research specifically. But but when you look at this, um, you, you, you see how closely related um, the impacts on research and the impacts on teaching are. Um, and um, so the abstract here talks about how ChatGPT can assist economists by describing dozens of use cases and talks about six broad areas. And I'll come back to these, but, you know, ideation and feedback, so kind of brainstorming, if you like, and somebody mentioned that on the Padlet already, um, actually writing, and I, I would use the term drafting actually there, but, you know, actually help with writing. Um, background research, once you know what you're doing, data analysis, coding, and mathematical derivations. I think there's br broader areas that we, we would want to consider. Um, but, you know, that paper talks, uh, makes a number of really interesting remarks that I just want to kind of preface my comments with. And first, I think these are sort of truism, really, really. It says it's easy and dangerous to overestimate the capabilities of these large language models. Um, and that, and that's... Um, that's partly uh, because it's very easy uh, to think that um, they uh, produce text that's, you know, it sounds highly authoritative, um, even when they're going off on a tangent, we call that hallucination. Um, and even when they get the content completely wrong, it sort of, um, it's, it's, it seems as if uh, they're really, really good, but actually they do make these mistakes. And then secondly, it's also dangerous and easy to underestimate the capabilities of large language models. Uh, partly because they do do this. They do regularly hallucinate. They do regularly make blatant mistakes. And, you know, to a certain extent, that's structurally embedded in the technology because of the fact that they are trained on information that may or may not be accurate, um, may or may not be representative, for example. So there may be biases being introduced as well. Um, so so these are kind of structural features. And, and so we need to take a kind of more level-headed view, I, I, I guess, of this. And and I want to start with this quote here, just uh, from that paper as well. Ultimately, I believe, um, this is the author speaking, that the most useful attitude towards generative AI is to heed the lessons of Ricardo and comparative advantage. Um, generative AI systems increasingly have comparative advantage in generating content. Humans have comparative advantage in evaluating and discriminating content, um, as well as in organizing research projects. So a lot of what I, um, I'm going to talk about really is just, you know, where where is this making an impact? How much should we, should we be worried about it? And what is the sector doing about all of this? Um, so there are things that the uh, that chat GPT AI um, language models do particularly well. And some of these, the top, the top, top few things here are actually taken from that paper that I've just mentioned. But, you know, giving feedback on drafts of papers, version four, you can upload papers, it can ask, ask ChatGPT, give you feedback on that. And, and you know, if you think about teaching, obviously feedback on, on written work and assessments, this is a, a, a very similar kind of practice. Providing counter arguments to um, arguments that you may present, I've talked about writing, synthesizing text into, um, in, into prose from, say, notes or bullet points. Um, and so on, you know, it can even act as a tutor for concepts. So, you know, teach, you can teach you about um, comparative advantage, for example. Brainstorming is a very big one, um, you know, getting initial ideas together. Um, there is a danger, of course, and I'll point out these dangers as I go along, but there is, of course, a danger that if everyone is using generative AI tools that have been trained um, with some resources to brainstorm about ideas, there's a danger that this leads to the same ideas and a lack of diversity in the sort of outputs and a certain homogeneity in the ideas that may be then developed further. Um, so a few other things I've just added here. I mean, drafting is a big word here. Um, I, I um, you know, drafting assessments, I'll show you an example of this in just a moment, that, 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 of, uh, that may make use of chat GPT in, in productive ways. Uh, drafting assessments that try to work around the um, issues to do with integrity that are posed by ChatGPT, 
initial drafts for, and I, I know a number of people who use ChatGPT for producing initial drafts for their teaching and for their lectures. Um, and so that's just a, a, a few things there. I'm not going to go through this diagram, but this is really interesting for what I wanted to just mention in a moment, which is that, th th so this paper also came out last year. This is an interesting um, paper by uh, Michel Villarreal and a whole series of other authors as well, uh, published in Education Sciences. And um, but why it's interesting is because it's an ethnographic uh, study of ChatGPT. In other words, they interview ChatGPT and ask it as if it's a kind of qualitative research subject. And they come up with this little diagram which has challenges. And, you know, thinking about ChatGPT, it, it seems the right way to sort of approach ChatGPT and language learning models of this type are to think in domains like this. You know, there are challenges. There are immense opportunities, some of which we've just mentioned a moment ago. Uh, there are big barriers, not least to do with um, access to this uh, this technology, awareness, technological barriers, ethics that Demetra has already talked about, and some priorities for the sector as well um, in, in higher education. And um, I asked ChatGPT4 what the main AI-related issues are facing teaching and learning in higher education. Um, and, and, you know, just to say, obviously, it's not a novel exercise. People have done this. That paper I just mentioned does this, and it publishes that those results. It's interesting that the results they get are very slightly different to what I'm getting now with ChatGPT4. But this list here is really important, I think, because it covers most of the issues in some way or other that uh, that have been discussed in the literature and in the sector, universities, and 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 also by regulatory bodies as well. So obviously, there's academic integrity and plagiarism that's coming through in the Padlet. Um, the impact this is having on critical thinking and the way students learn. You know, are they now learning in a more shallow manner because a lot of the work that they would have previously done is being done by ChatGPT? There's an issue about equity access to the software, uh, knowledge of how it works, how best to deploy it, what you are allowed and what you're not allowed to do and so on. Uh, there's a, There are issues to do with the way that we as academics and teachers and universities adapt our teaching methods and our assessments to this technology. There's a really big uh, discussion around the place about um, the reliability. I mean, we had this even with Google and search engines, but but it, but it's kind of multiplied to to an, a, a bigger degree with uh, these language learning models. Um, so you know, how reliable is this information? How, how much of it is how much of it is lies and just you know, falsehoods? And then there are of course ethical and privacy concerns um, uh, uh, to do with, uh, as Demetra mentioned with student data, putting data into this engine, what happening to it, um, AI methods of surveillance, which are being used um, outside chat GPT, but AI more generally to do um, uh, to do uh, invigilation and so on in um, proctoring in, in, in examinations. And um, this really important issue of AI engines and the the bias that comes through from the uh, the, the content that these things are being trained on. Um, so they're only as good as what the what the training uh, training contains, and then um, um, the uh, uh, is issues to do with skills development. And so um, you know the the move. Um, what what does AI these kind this kind of AI imply for what skills are important in the future of work? You know, so things like emotional intelligence ethical judgment, creativity, precisely those areas where these engines are just not very good because they are not uh, human. And um, there's one thing missing here, which the Russell Group, I'm going to mention in just a moment, the Russell Group picks up on, uh, which is exploitation. Um, so, so there are deeper ethical sort of concerns, and the Russell Group picked up on exploitation in the way that these engines are developed and trained and how they're making use of very cheap labor abroad, the same kind of concerns that we've had in the retail clothing industry, for example. Um, so uh, what do students think about this? Uh, the, HEPI did a, a survey last year as well. So obviously we've only had a year really of this, a little bit longer. And so a lot of work has been emerging. Um, and in November uh, of last year, they asked 1,200, uh, just over 1,000 students, um, undergraduate students, about um, these a number of questions. Some of the results are here. So what do they were using it for? Were they using it for help with assessment? Um, some of them say they actually use it 
for writing parts of the assessment, 13% there, um, and 5% even say that they're using it without any editing, so not as a kind of drafting procedure. Um, many students, a third here, don't know that it uh, how badly it can get things wrong. And, and this term hallucination is a kind of um, well-accepted term for what these engines can do sometimes. They just, because of the way the generation of text works in these engines, they can just go off on a tangent very quickly because it's, it's all based on conditional probabilities of what the next word ought to be. Uh, and then uh, obviously the digital divide um, comes across in the data that they looked at. So the people who were using it more knew more about it tended to be within certain groups of students um, and less so other groups of students. So that was something coming out of the survey. Um, may, most students find it, well, two thirds of students found it acceptable uh, to be used as a way of learning um, concepts. Um, and a small number are satisfied with the support that they're getting from their universities uh, in, in using AI, about a fifth. And then uh, the the majority, three quarters, think uh, think it is part of the world, and they expect to continue using it as they go uh, out into to the world of work. And their recommendations from this Happy report were that, um, and and you know this this is no different really uh, to most recommendations that you'll find either in the Russell Group or or elsewhere. Um, around this area, that institutions need to develop clear policies of what AI use is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. And secondly, that where there are benefits, uh, quite uh, I, well identified benefits, that institutions should teach students how to use it effectively. And also importantly, to check whether, so not take it as the final piece, but to check whether the content is of high quality and therefore have to revise it, for example. And um, uh, so what is the broader picture here then? So I, I've already mentioned there have been sector responses. And so a couple of few links here that you might want to follow up um, if you haven't seen these already. But there is some interesting work uh, by uh, groups in the sector. So the Russell Group is the one I was looking at in detail because my university was involved um, in this. And so, um, uh, so as I say, you know, the concerns and the responses that they raise are not too different to the ones that ChatGPT told me about that I showed you on a slide just a moment ago with the addition of this uh, problem of exploitation that they highlight. Um, and institutional responses are starting to develop as well. Um, so, you know, the HEPI said, uh, universities need to give students guidance on how to use this, what's right, what isn't right, what's acceptable, what isn't acceptable, and good use of AI. Um, my university, Bristol University, has developed um, a, a whole set of resources there for students to kind of go through, and it's like a training module um, to sort of identify what they could do with it, what's acceptable, what isn't. And I think that is available publicly, but because I it works for me, I'm a I, I don't know if that's because I'm logged in or not. And then interestingly enough, in some of the journals as well, our, the guidelines for authors are starting to develop um, AI-specific uh, guidelines about scientific writing. So the the journal for um, uh, for sorry, the uh, journal that's associated with the Economics Network, uh, International Review of Inter Economics Education, has uh, a decl uh, has um, a a requirement that that's, um, writers should um, submit a declaration of a generative AI in their writing, and that's available at, at this link here. I haven't seen one for the Journal of Economics Education, but I do know that many other economics journals in the research space are, are, are doing this. Um, so I'm just going to skip through these really, really quickly. Um, I asked ChatGPT how to avoid some of the problems posed by chat gpt and you notice their words like you know it says critical thinking creativity so, so it kind of knows what it can't do well right application of knowledge understanding um and and you know here's more detail i, I apologize for skipping through this really quickly but i just wanted to just sort of flash this by you sort of you know using open-ended questions um, applying concepts to new situations, reflective journals, oral exams, critiquing models, policies or theories, providing evidence for viewpoints, right? So that kind of thing. I then asked ChatGPT, how could uh, slightly different, sli same question with slightly different twist, you know, how could ChatGPT be used within assessments, not, not avoided, but used uh, while retaining integrity? And you'll see here it talks about um, higher order thinking skills rather than factual recall. I think we're probably all familiar with that. 
but um, a, a, incorporating a component of the assessment that requires personal reflection, explanation of thought processes, in-person discussion, um, and, you know, the, it produces a, a similar kind of list of things that you could be doing um, if you wanted to get ChatGPT to, uh, incorporated with, with within assessments um, and um, uh, while retaining integrity. And then finally, um, I asked it to set an assessment for me. Um, uh, and uh, I asked it to set an environmental economics assessment, which would use ChatGPT and yet be uh, robust against uh, problems of integrity. And this is what it came up uh, came up with. And, you know, I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but I actually think this is quite good. Right. And um, so it asks you to use ChatGPT to research certain things. So this is the brainstorming phase, um, the research phase. It, it then has a critical analysis, um, a policy proposal, a reflection. That was one of the things that came out quite strongly. And then suggests that the submission should include the research notes from ChatGPT, your critical analysis, policy proposal and reflection. Ensure your analysis critically engages with the information provided by ChatGPT. Um, demonstrating your ability to synthesize information and apply economic principles to environmental issues. So, 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 so I'm I just finished by saying that you know I think um, I, I think the the university, the sector, um, and the literature seems to be moving to a space of uh, working with ChatGPT and and really exploiting its positives uh, while while being um, while being in tune with some of the some of the problems that we face. I think that, you know there sometimes there's a tendency to to err on the side of of, of, of worry here, um, but we can learn as as we've seen um, a lot from ChatGPT. I'll leave you with I asked it also finally to write me a short haiku poem about economics assessment in the age of ChatGPT. And again, I think this is great. <laughs> I'll pass back to, uh, I'm passing to Carlos, I think. Right. So um, I decided to uh, set this survey um, back in October uh, just to try and get a sense of what was happening in the sector. Uh, you, from conversation with colleagues, uh, it was quite immediately clear that the way different institutions and different academics were um, adapting to to ChatGPT and AI um, engines was was very different, and I just didn't have no idea what was going on more generally. So I decided to set this this survey. Um, it's got uh, uh, not a very large response rate, but it does have responses from the UK, the US, and even some European um, universities. Hopefully, this will be the base for, for a discussion uh, later on. So I asked a few questions. Um, let me see. So the first question I asked was, uh, do you know what your university policy is on the use of generative AI? Um, you know, about two thirds said yes, uh, quite clearly. Um, sorry, I'm going too fast. <laughs> Um, so two thirds said yes. There's a few people who weren't sure or, or no, but again, this was opened in October, so it's possible that this situation has changed um, uh, since then. Uh, the second question I asked was um, whether your university, their university, allowed students to use AI or not, and you can see the results here. Uh, Seventeen percent. Um, basically forbid students from using AI at all, uh, completely in their assessments. Some universities, about 30% allows, but does not encourage students to use AI. 13% uh, allows and encourages students to use AI. And then there's a, a, a about a third of other, which most of the time uh, are academics that report a combination of these things happening at the same time. Um, there was some free text that asked for, for people to provide a few further details, and I just want to highlight uh, uh, some, some of those um, uh, quotes so, so that we can see the vari variety of, of opinions that come out. Um, so uh, one academic says that it was um, AI was allowed for research purpose purposes, but it could not be used for the creation of outputs. Uh, I, I read this as being, you know, essays or, or, or output for, for an exam. Uh, 
in, in another colleague said that the default is to not allow AI in, um, in in the assessments, but unit directors have some discretion. So again, the rule uh, within these some universities is not um, uh, the same necessarily for for everyone because there's some discretion and you know, academics can use their their judgment whether they allow their students to use it or not. Um, uh, Another example of students being allowed, this is the students can use AI, but they have to admit that they've used it and explain exactly how they've used it. Um, again, another example where the lecturer can decide where the students can, um, so at the module level can decide whether the students can use it or not. Uh, and so there's again, some flexibility in, in, in some universities. Um, other universities are completely the opposite, so they go completely to the other extreme. They say AI is considered commissioning and is considered to be a serious academic offence, so no use at all is permitted. Um, and again, in some cases, it's a, it's a mix of the two. Uh, AI is allowed to to be used for some things, but not for others. For example, in this example, we can see that it's allowed for editing and retrieving information, but not allowed for writing an essay or a paragraph in, a, in an assessment. And again, some people, some, some academics um, require students to ask permission to use AI first, and they need approval of the academic. So as you can see, there's a wide variety of, of, of practices um, within the sector, which I find quite, quite interesting. Different universities are adopting and deciding on, on what to do in a different way. The next question was, uh, have you made any changes um, in, terms, in terms of your assessment in your modules um, because of, of AI? And about 31% did not change uh, anything at all, which is also an interesting result, I find. Um, uh, about 11% moved from online to in-person assessments uh, as, a, as a response. Um, a, a large proportion of 35% changed the type of questions asked, and we'll see some comments in just a minute that very often is, involves asking students questions about specific papers of specific uh, things that were covered in the lectures and the tutorials. So students have to link their answer to, um, to what they learned in the lecture. And 19%, uh, again, um, decided to change the type of assessments, um, sometimes, uh, you know, moving away from essays to, to exams and, 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 other, and other changes like that. Now, again, I ask for further details to this question because there's so much variety, so I decided to, to ask that. And we can see, again, a big variation in, in, in practices. So one academic said he was going to move the online quiz to an in-class closed book with blocking software. I'm not quite sure how this is um, going to be uh, achieved, but um, that was the plan. Uh, others went again to the other extreme, where immediately they adopted ChatGPT uh, into, into their assessment. Um, and so output of ChatGPT was provided to students, and at the end they had to critique it and provide some feedback on that. Uh, again, uh, some people incorporated AI immediately in major summative assessments um, and in the, the work of tutorials. Uh, uh, and as I was saying, some, some academics try to make the assessments more resilient by ma making the questions more specific to, to the module content, to the readings and what was covered in the lectures. Um, uh, some academics also decided to go for a mix of the two. I suppose this is a, a more cautious approach, which could provide some, some data to see uh, if this is working or not. And so there's a, a mix between in-person exams and coursework. Uh, and, and, and crucially also, they provide formative exercises to teach um, students how to use uh, ChatGPT, which is what Alvin was just talking about that we all need, need to do. And again, in, in, in one of the extremes, a lot of people switch to in-person exams. Um, but in these examples, just for first and second year students, which kind of suggests that final year students, um, um, that was not the case. Um, and again, uh, another way to make exams uh, and assessments more resilient, open book exams required to use specific citations and materials from CRAS, which is something that 
uh, chat GPT and other generative AI are still not very good at, at doing. So lots of adaptation in terms of the, the type of questions that, that have been asked. Uh, another area that interested me was was the issue of plagiarism, and I asked the question whether the uni the universities where academics are based allows them to use plagiarism detection tools to detect the use of generative AI. I was a bit surprised that the vast majority, almost two thirds, um, they were allowed to do this. In my own institution, we not allowed to do it. Um, I think that the wisdom here is that uh, those tools are not reliable enough. Uh, there's a lot of examples of false negatives and false positives coming up. And so the the quality of the evidence is not doesn't meet the th threshold necessary for to present in academic misconduct um, uh, committees. So we simply are not allowed um, to use it. Uh, but I did ask for the subsets of academics where they are allowed to use it, how how do they use it? And 17% and actually use ChatGPT to see uh, and ask them if it was uh, AI generated. I think this is not very reliable, but it, it, this is how they do it. Uh, a third uh, of academics um, are allowed to hold a viva. So if they suspect a student of, of, of academic misconduct, and this is a... I suppose a resource intensive uh, but very reliable way to detect if a student is 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 um, is using ChatGPT in a way that he shouldn't be using it, um, and then uh, the vast majority of academics seem to continue to rely on tools like Turnitin uh, to detect the use of AI. I know Turnitin is planning to introduce their own AI uh, engine to detect uh, AI. Uh, but the last I've heard, again, it's not it's not very uh, reliable to date. So I, I just wanted to provide a very quick overview of, of, of these results. I'll be happy to share uh, the slides and, and answer any questions you may have. But I think it's really important that we can start the discussion as soon as, as, soon as possible. So I'll, I'll just stop here and uh, open the floor to, to comments and, and questions. So thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Carlos. And thanks, Alvin, as well. Who wants to go ahead, either in the chat or in just unmute and speak up? Maybe um, indicate to who your question is directed, or that would be helpful. Or yeah, go ahead, Tom. <laughs> Hi there. Yeah, thanks. That was really interesting. So just by way of background, um, uh, I work for the Government Economic Service, and our interest is in assessing as a recruiter of economists. Um, I was really interested in the example where you'd asked uh, ChatBT, GPT, um, how to design a, 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 an assessment that incorporates um, AI. I just wonder whether there are any examples of that being used anywhere. Not that specific example, but that approach. Shall I come back in with that, Demetra? Yeah, go ahead. Um, no, so the short answer is no. Uh, what, what, one of the things that um, and, and I teach environmental economics, which is why I, I did that. Um, one of the things that we're doing this year is we've always assessed environmental economics using a policy report. So asking students to, you know, rather like, a, you know, imagine they might go and work in the government economic service and so they have to write policy reports for a minister. Um, and, um, and so one of the things we're doing this year is we have employed a researcher who will be putting our current assessment for this year and seeing what um, he can do with ChatGPT in in order to kind of plagiarize with it, you know, to sort of cheat with it, and also to do what I was trying to do there, which was to think about how could we redesign it so that a it was it's the, the both questions I asked ChatGPT in in sequence, you know, how how could we ChatGPT proof it uh, in terms of maintaining its integrity, but also how could we productively use ChatGPT within it. And so the plan is that next year we'd have the perfect um, the perfect assessment for that for that course. Um, but as you see, I think the answer to that question is that ChatGPT four is a lot more capable than ChatGPT three point five. Um, and uh, we were talking about this just before this 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 session. There's a kind of a, I it, at least to a non technical person like me in terms of computing, it's um, it it's exponentially different. You know, there's a big 
its capabilities have increased enormously. So its ability to be reflective in that sense, you know, to sort of think about how could I, what, what would I as chat GPT not be good at doing? And so what should you be asking? I, th I think that, you know, this is, it's an amazing resource for that. And, but I, what I would say is whenever you use chat GPT for anything at the moment, what it produces is is generally a very good draft often it's a very poor draft because it has just goes off and does it goes up and hallucinates but but it's a very good draft to start this and i can imagine the ges um making good use of that really um you know i think it's, it's certainly worth exploring but i'm not sure it's very mainstream yet because the capabilities have been have improved very recently Many thanks, Alvin. Um, and that was a really good question. I think the next person in the queue is Dunley. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, sure. It's a, it's a very quick question. First of all, thanks a lot for organizing the session. It's a super, super helpful and interesting. So this is a, a very quick question to, to Carlos. So the survey is also uh, very impressive. Um, I think one of the survey questions is about this uh, AI detection tool asked uh, whether the academics are allowed to use this uh, um, AI detection tool. And I'm just wondering that, yeah, you mentioned a few concerns about the force, is a positive or force negative, they, they are not necessarily reliable. But another potential concerns is about this, uh, this data protection because the student work, yeah, the student have the intellectual property right. And then whether, whether academics are really allowed to, to put the student work in some this software. I'm just wondering if this is discussing your survey or not as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, it, 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 thank you for the question. It, it wasn't explicitly a, a question I asked, but it, it, it is clearly something that's coming up um, for, from the practice. There is an intellectual property uh, problem because everything you share with ChatGPT becomes open. It goes basically becomes becomes public knowledge, and I've I've heard of a lot of uh, tech companies that forbidding are forbidding their workers to to upload their code for example into ChatGPT so that ChatGPT can 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 correct the mistakes and so on precisely for that reason because once um, they upload that that information into uh, into the public domain then it, it, ChatGPT will use that and probably it could share that 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 um, intellectual property with, with everybody else um and I think some universities have similar concern, concerns about that. It's 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 not just about in integrity and academic misconduct. It's also about that issue about um, intellectual property and data protection, because um, obviously there are a lot of ethical issues behind this. And and without without those permissions, without making sure that the data is protected, that there are serious dangers as well. Thanks, Carlos. That's great. Uh, Ashley. Um, I have a, a question from Cloda that's in the chat because I think Cloda is um, having to be on the road somewhere, so she's perhaps less able to speak. But she said, this is a question for Alvin, but Dimitra and Carlos, you may also have comments on it. Um, have you heard any discussion of use of AI reinforcing bi biases and maybe pulling us back from things like decolonizing the curriculum? Um, because the words that um, a large language may not be very inclusive. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's right. And it, I think it's been known for a long time that wherever AI technologies have been deployed, um, they repeat the culture that they're trained on. So, um, um, you know, we've had, we've, there's there's uh, studies looking at um, facial recognition in criminal justice systems and policing. Um, uh, we've, we've certainly institutions like mine have been very worried about certain types of proctoring, which is using facial recognition to do proctoring of exams. And it's the same, it's no different. I mean, AI is no different wherever it's being used. It's being trained on, um, social data, which by its very nature replicates cultural biases and cultural assumptions and cultural proportions of people, you know, so so there is a real danger that this and this is the point i was trying to get out with talking about brain uh, brainstorming which which chat is very good at but we will end up with 
a, a lack of diversity in the ideas. You know, if, if that's what we use to generate, to do brainstorming and we're not supplementing that um, with other voices like our own, then um, then there's a real risk of uh, a loss of diversity. Uh, so, so absolutely. And I think um, the decolonization point is true. I think there's a it what what chat gp you know on a very very broad level what it does is replicate the culture and replicate our understanding because that's what it that's what it is it is 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 our current understanding and so if we want to replicate that and use it very quickly efficiently um that's a that's a very useful thing in terms of productivity but it's not a very useful thing in terms of diversity and inclusivity and it's a real danger thanks alvin i i had a question maybe for the for for everyone in the audience really is there discussion in your universities about the university funding access to ChatGPT or other AI? Because, of course, to um, to get ChatGPT for you have to pay, right? Mm -hmm. And there are access issues there for students, and even individual colleagues are putting in expense claims at the moment. And there's a lot of discussion about well, surely we should have a sort of universal license for something. I, I mean, I'm just curious to know we're we're quite far from it at the moment. Uh, at LSE, because there is very there is no universal agreement quite yet, um, but that is what's being discussed. And I think for inclusivity, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, the richer kids are kind of able to afford all these different AI, and others are not so uh, able to. Yeah, twenty four pounds per month. That's a lot for an undergraduate, probably. Um, especially for widening participation, I would say. What's interesting, Dimitri, just quickly to yeah. add to what you just said, is that HEPI survey, you know, it wasn't an enormous survey, but there was a difference, not just in terms of income groups, and there was a difference in the, in, in the kind of, you know, knowledge of AI and use of it amongst um, sort of richer students versus poorer students. But it also split against across uh, ethnicities and various other groupings as well. So it's not, it's not just that uh, uh, dimension. It's it's other dimensions as well, and subject disciplines, and you know, so on. Yeah, that's very important. Oh, sorry, there's stuff coming in in the chat that I'm looking at. <laughs> Gemini is so the first two months free trial. That's that's useful if you want to play around. Um, yeah. Other questions or thoughts. Well, you know, Carlos, I think I'm in your survey results. I think that essay that went through Turnitin, that, that I got students to do that, I think that might have been me. Uh, <laughs> it was to break anonymity there. Um, so, yeah, I got students to, it was just part of a little class exercise to put their, um, to put an essay question uh, relating to, it was welfare economics in a micro course, and it was an essay question around welfareism versus non-welfareist approaches to social welfare. So quite discursive. Put that in ChatGPT. Um, submit them all into me in Moodle, but then come to class ready to critically discuss. Mm. First of all, they all thought it was great, right? They thought the essay was great when it wasn't. But more importantly, I had 400 different essays um, on the same question. And Turnitin couldn't detect anything. No. Um, but I, but actually we, I asked each of my TAs to read all 20 in their group and tell me if they thought it felt like 20 students submitting separate essays and it really didn't. So this idea you had Alvin about ideas not being that diverse, it did feel like the same essay rehashed mm. with different language 400 times. Um, so yeah, I did get the feeling that I mean, I, I mean, that their input, their intellectual input was very low in that one. Yeah. Um, so if you, yeah, so you know, in it on its own, it, I felt it was well written but yeah. hollow. Uh, yeah, I think it's good. it's a bit like well, what Alvin um, mentioned mm. earlier. I mean, if you see that as a draft, as a first draft, and a, a good student will improve that draft tremendously, and. Um, and, and work on it. If you just copy paste, then obviously the quality is still not there. But I, I did ask the same question exactly about 10 times in a row. And what I did notice is that each answer was very similar to the previous one, 
But when you compare the first and the tenth, there are quite significant differences, uh, and especially if you do it across several days, because the the data the data set might might change and the input might change. Um, and so it also depends if you allow students to choose their own prompts or, or if, if you force students using exactly the same prompt, because if you change um, slightly the question you're asking, the result might change uh, exactly again. But it's interesting to me that um, how students think that the quality is is extremely high and, and, and it's not most of the time. It's not 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 yet anyway. Um, uh, and that's precisely why we see so many colleagues now trying to ask questions that require some judgment, some 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 higher skills, and linking it to um, events or, or papers that were discussed in the classroom. Because again, that's something ChatGPT can't do just yet. But uh, but it's evolving really fast. That's the other thing I I, I find is that from one month to the next. Um, Things change so quickly. And, and here at my institution, for the first time, um, I just heard of a case of a colleague who was allowed to change his assessment mid-year to account for the AI. So he changed the assessment. He was allowed because normally we have to make these plans two years in advance. But he was allowed to change mid-year because precisely of the impact of, of, of AI. And he introduced a, an assessment that required the users ChatGPT. So that's also an example of universities responding to, you know, changing their priorities. So I, I find that that's interesting. A bit more flexible than usual. That's good to hear. Yeah. Uh, essays written in a course that, I mean, we don't have many essays in economics at LSC because it's very quantitative, but we have one course for PPE students where students have to write an essay. And there's a lot of concern that um, they might be not really understanding what's in their essay if they overuse chat GPT. So imagine, you know, we worry that some of the authorship isn't really theirs. So we've switched to, um, they write the essay, but they have to prepare a, was it a five minute video explaining how they approach the essay, what challenges they faced, what, the, you know, you, pretty much what Alvin was saying earlier on, which is really about um, the part where you're sort of um, critiquing or sort of the person, I mean, ChatGPT suggested something where there's a personal reflection. I don't know how well it works in what you're suggesting, Tom, but, you know, um, even if it's a person, you, even if it's a video rather than a written response, if it's something that's been read out of ChatGPT, you might be able to tell better than you know, than, than a spontaneous response that feels authentic. Mm. I don't know if, but then we're using our own subjective judgments on someone's video. I think it works better for an assessment than a short question, but we yeah. are. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I mean, I think the yeah. things I worry about when we start bringing our own subjective judgment. Yeah, it, exactly. It's all these other biases that we've kind of been trying to, to avoid. Um, but yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, Alvin or anyone else want to add their experiences to anything like that? I agree, Dimitri, that I think the reflection is really powerful in this space, really, to sort of get students to um, give personal reflections on um, what they've written as part of the submission um, is, is really, really useful. And then the other side of it is the kind of corroboration and verification. I don't know if you have that stage in that assessment. Probably, you know, it sounds from what you say, you probably don't. But to, to ask them to reflect, you know, if you were then sort of talking to them later to ask them to reflect, to reflect on what they wrote, which acts as a kind of corroboration stage <laughs> as opposed to an, an upfront mm -hmm. uh, reflection. But I think yeah. that personal reflection is, is is very, very powerful because you're talking about things that are in their personal lived experience. Um, so reflection yeah. would work particularly well. Thank you. Yeah, and um, um, just on this part of these, yeah, this stage of the recruitment process, it's purely written. It will then go on to like the next, it's a way of sifting down because it's a bulk recruitment process and then it would be you know you'd interview some of those so that part of the reflection could come in later when well, in fact does you've got to do the interview but at this stage it's purely what is written mm. but of course it might create noise in your selection if <laughs> if people are using it in the way you don't intend well i think there's a there's a question in the chat by uh cloda uh which is about suppose you know it's prohibited in some way and then you suspect students are using it how do we even try and prove their use of it so is it a viva and she adds um 
her experience with job applications is that when people use it, it's not really the best applications, right? So it's, you know, maybe an act of desperation <laughs> to be it's maybe a job application. But um, yeah, um, does anyone have any experience with Vivas with f for chat GPT purposes? Um, I, I think here Vibers are used when there are um, suspicions um, about about using ChatGPT precisely to to get some evidence of academic misconduct. It's very research intensive, and this is a comment to uh, to the previous uh, comment: is that all, all these extra steps that we need to introduce they require extra time, extra resources, and, and it's difficult to actually um, avoid doing that because you know the, the ai can, can can produce large quantities of text in in seconds and and and, and sometimes just to check would be um, uh, it's it's time consuming i think one way is to ask you know uh, students or, or candidates to to give examples of their own life their own applying applying whatever the question is about their own uh, experience and asking them to provide examples relating to that their own person um but it is it is um very resource intensive so it, it takes... just on your resource point there carlos i mean i i i agree with you and we do the same thing so you know we use turnitin but you can't rely on that for evidence so then it goes to a viber and i haven't been involved in any of this but i know that's the practice but that you know if you were if you want to take a sort of more positive spin or optimistic view of this i mean it ought to be possible for us to do less of certain types of assessment and more of others so you know if we are using vibers or if we are using reflection we no longer need to test certain types of things which we know chat gpt can do very well and actually that you know your knowledge could also be tested through your reflection so you know that so the positive spin on this is that this is a, a strong um, push for a different kind of assessment altogether that we've been used to and if we stick with that we will have a resource issue in universities no, I, I totally agree i mean if a viva is Re replacing something then 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 it can work very well but if it's on top of everything else then it becomes a problem yeah and even in the case of that essay it's now become an essay and a video that someone has to look at yeah. and evaluate and make a judgment about things that we can't definitively know now we had a vibe on a case of a student but it was at the beginning of the launch of chat gpt where students were not aware of the hallucination of citations now there's a lot more awareness and they're getting um so yeah we introduced a um an assessment which was for students to build a chatbot in macroeconomics and you build a chatbot to give you accurate information to macro questions so they so i saw a student i said oh you're excited i know they quite like this kind of thing so, so you're excited about this macro chatbot and they said oh but we've already built one for econometrics and i said oh is that in the assessment and they're like no 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 we, we did it in our own time because it was so useful um, so, you know, our students are building chatbots and we're kind of pondering whether we should mm -hmm. get them to do it. But they're already doing it. Anyway, um, interesting times. Yeah, Makes yeah, me feel yeah. very old, though. Makes me feel very old. It's awful. <laughs> I, I've heard of, a, of an interesting um, episode it was a, a candidate uh, interview where, you know, a lecturer, a lecturer that presents a teaching session were giving the same question. And um, the question, the answer ChatGPT churned out was wrong, and obviously the panel knew that it was wrong, um, and and a lot of the candidates basically just regurgitated what ChatGPT was providing, <laughs> and only a few actually noticed that there was a mistake in the answer. So it can also be used in that way if you know that the output is incorrect or incomplete. You can use that as a way to detect. <laughs> Great. It's three o'clock, time has flown. Thank you all so much for your contributions and huge thanks, especially to Alvin and Carlos for their um, presentation. If you haven't been, so I've been having a look, some of you have been writing in Padlet as the session has unfolded. Please do so if you haven't, and we'll just reflect on those and shape the next sessions. And we're really excited to see you there. Thank you all for coming along. Nice to see everyone. <laughs>